Through all of that insight, well over 10,000 hours of classroom delivery, working with some of the UK's best, best known executives and CEOs, I've come to understand <laughs> the power of diversity as a commercial opportunity. Standby, I'll be right there. Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 345. Today is Sunday the 20th of October 2019. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. And this week's interview is with Daniel Snell, Daniel's director and co-founder of Arrival Education, an award-winning talent and development business, offering total diversity solutions to forward-thinking businesses. In this conversation with Daniel, we dig into his work on diversity and inclusion, how to tap into the potential of your team and unlock the diversity dividend, how to make education more effective, and how to make change, including attitudes at work. Daniel Snell, great to have you on the show. You uh, and I were introduced to one another by our friend Mutual Tiffany. And we and, and you are the founder of a great company that's called Arrival Education, uh, which has been around now for 10 years plus. Yeah. Tell us in your own words, Daniel, how do you describe yourself? Thank you, Minter, and thank you to all the listeners. So I would describe myself as an entrepreneur, definitely. And I would also describe myself as a visionary that is endeavoring to unlock the social capital out of UK PLC because there's brilliant organizations in this country and full of brilliant people and I think some of that talent is untapped oh boy is there a lot of untapped potential so um, Daniel tell us a little bit more about uh, yourself and how did you get into this notion uh, of a rival education well Perhaps the ground was already fertile, but um, I guess in terms of this story, because it's very much a passion story, it was started um, by me when um, my flatmate at the time, her younger brother was stabbed to death in a street incident. And so that experience of observing her struggling and also trying to get my head around why two young men would get to the point where one would kill another over a game of snake on a Nokia phone uh, for me got me thinking and um, I guess I'm kind of interested in ideas and I'm interested in people and I'm interested in um, talent and, and I wanted to make a difference hmm. I think that's a very important part of my DNA is to feel like my time and maybe this is a confident thing maybe we haven't talked about this but I believe that I am worthy of making a difference and maybe not everybody thinks that. Mm. Or maybe I also believe that I've got something to give and not everybody thinks that. Well, by, by, by dint of the fact that you're actually doing is proof of the confidence that's behind it because a lot of people might have the idea but the execution doesn't, oh, well, yeah, maybe tomorrow. Right. And also, maybe I also have a high tolerance for risk because mm -hmm. I'm not sure... It would be a sensible career move in terms of what I did, although it's the thing I'm the most proud of. And I've done some pretty cool things, um, but I wanted to make a difference. And then ultimately I threw myself full time into something that had a profound levels of purpose and meaning, out of which I grew a business, out of which I have, I guess, transformed the lives of a lot of people and some businesses. All right, so Arrival Education, as you were saying before we started interviewing, you have had something like 5,000 kids go through it. Tell us what is the program and what are you trying to achieve? Well, we have written and delivered over 100 programs. So I guess a lot of the programs are in response to need. However, kind of the program where I guess we really got stuck in to that community, because effectively we have two clients, we have businesses and senior executive teams of leading businesses. The PLCs. The PLCs, um, which is, you know, when we get into that story is where I'm from, so obviously that's important to me. And then the community that I became very passionate about, which effectively is socially and ethnically 
gifted to talent, talent from talent pools that aren't usually looked at by UK PLC or probably any PLC, to be honest. Right, so diversity the, is, is essentially the, the bottom line in here. It's a word that we talk a lot about. You, you see it in the press. There's a lot of talk, but the, the challenge continuously is actually making it happen. You know, we might hire someone who's ethnically diverse, but then it doesn't really work out. So how do you go about getting diversity to stick? Okay, well, there's lots of interesting points. Let's unpack some of them. So I, I have some issues with the way that PLC are currently trying to address this agenda. And also, let's just clarify, when we're talking about diversity, from my perspective, my perspective, my expertise is around socially and ethnically diverse talent. I don't move a, across the other protected characteristics, right. so I just don't have an opinion to give. Or You'll find people who've got much better opinions than I have because I just don't have any depth there. Yeah. And I like I, my experience of myself is I like to stay where I know things mm -hmm. because, you know, once you've really invested, uh, you know, one can learn things from reading books or reading articles. But when it, it comes to really understanding things, you have to invest a lot of time. Well, I mean, the, the idea of expertise, you know, as soon as you start diluting the diversity to gender, handicap or every other different type, then you can't possibly know enough about the specificities and the challenges within each of those pools and how they, you know, my wife is handicapped and, and, and the challenges that she has when she walks around, something I pick up all the time because I'm in it. But it's, it's a different regard and it needs to be coached in a different way. Yeah, that's right. I think that's right. And there's people who are deeply expert at those different things, usually because they themselves have a passion or an experience that have led them to a particular journey that of which... Like you have. Like I have, exactly. So, um, so let's just unpack some of those early experiences because that journey has led me to now. Um, and when I talk about me, I think it's probably really important to talk about Emily, who's my co-founder, because every step of the way we've been on this journey together so you know she should be in the room with me talking because she has a whole bunch of different experiences through that process well maybe in in um, in true amazon fashion we have an empty chair and maybe that empty chair we will refer to as emma I like, it's a little political given that boris was empty chaired yesterday wasn't it? empty podium yeah. podium gate um so um, so after the uh, the incident where my uh, flatmate's younger brother was murdered, I started to give my spare time around my work commitments, and I was working in the city. And um, I, I, I wrote and delivered programs to very challenging young people, people of you know were really interesting, um, not always academically gifted, but gifted. And that's a really important thing to pull out. Um, you know, the people who engage with what we were saying or what I was saying. And I really caught the bug. And so I did that around work. So thank you, those original businesses, for allowing me to take an afternoon off once a, a week or whatever to coach young people. And then I threw myself into it in a full-time way with a school that was particularly challenging. I gave up, you know, my job and security and all of that, and obviously a very understanding partner, and really went for it. And I guess I was looking for key insights that would ultimately give me something that could scale and that could assure some sort of impact. And then what it grew into is a program called Successful Life, which effectively was my approach of how to create a learning experience that was very three-dimensional that assured social mobility that was the, that was the attempt but what do you mean by three-dimensional well three-dimensional in so much as we were delivering change behavioral change content in classroom experiences and we were giving as they got more mature because it's a four-year program as they got more able we were then also skilling them in the attitudinal mindsets that we knew businesses wanted. And we kind of cogitated all of those insights and turned them into classroom content. Plus, they were going into 
work-based experiences. So there could be workshops, and we had kind of co-created all of this workshop curriculum. Plus, then they were getting mentored and coached by executives from our corporate partners. Plus, then they were having work experiences and internships from these corporate experiences. Plus, they were set personal development challenges and their own uh, social impact challenges. Plus, then they were had their educational experience. And so th- th- what happened as a byproduct of all of that development input is they all grew, the, the, the ones that were able to, um, and really took on their lives. And obviously that experience for me and for the team was hugely rewarding and very insightful and uh, really changed my attitudes around a whole range of things, actually, both in terms of like how we define talent, what's possible, why some people get on in the world of work and why some people don't, and what are, what are those social issues and what's wrong with the social fabric and the educational system and the pathways from education into the world of work and who holds the doors, who are the gatekeepers of talent in UK PLC and what are they really looking for versus what they say and and then obviously over that period I've really come to understand businesses whether it's at a, at a DNI CSR engagement level or whether it's an executive level or whether it's an HRD level or an L&D level you know I've really spidered over these businesses to understand what the issues are and through all of that insight well over 10,000 hours of classroom delivery, working with some of the UK's best and best known executives and CEOs. I've come to understand <laughs> the power of diversity as a commercial opportunity and no longer to be seen as a charitable action where white middle class people, quote unquote, help poor black people because that just doesn't work. All right, so there's a bunch of stuff you just ran out there. And uh, what, uh, I need to find out what you learned or might sort of advise if you had the chance to rewrite education as it stands, whether it's for socially and ethnically different people or just plain old white people. How could education be done better as a starting point? Well, I think... Not everybody learns in the same way. So I think one of the issues is that our current model is very inflexible. It's basically Victorian. It's built along a model of, you know, working class people work in the factories, grammar school, middle class kids manage them, and wealthy people go to private school and own the factories. But that doesn't work anymore uh, at any level. And everybody's smart enough not to... (laughs) want those particular paths or or certainly willing doesn't want we won't accept them right so and also uh, the things that kids are leaving school with um, aren't really fit for purpose for the world of work and at the other side of the spectrum the world of work complain that young people don't have the skill sets or attitudes or abilities or whatever mindsets for the world of work so it's just broken and uh to your question, like how could it be improved, I think we need to understand that everybody learns differently and you have to be able to tailor learning experiences to that difference. Um, obviously, people are looking at digital as the nirvana. And my concern is that if you, are, if you haven't got up to a kind of capacity to be able to take in and understand and navigate digital, then you're going to completely be lost. And I think there's a a real need for human connection in the learning experience. And I think it needs to be immersive and I think it needs to be experiential and I think it needs to be fit for purpose and have context. So I remember writing some papers around this when I was building out Successful Life around contextualized education I was calling it essay as in being an essence and essential that effectively what you need is a set of experiences that get to the essence of why people want to learn because if people don't want to learn in the first place they're just never going to learn right dead but, horse dead horse but if you if you haven't eaten 
yesterday and your dad stepdad's abusive and your mum's got three jobs and you're responsible for your younger siblings and you've got mold coming up the side of your walls and you live in some really nasty social housing and your local communities riddled with violence and anxiety you're not going to sit still and listen to a state teacher who's probably doing the best they can with a very constrained curriculum that isn't really meeting who's in the room or what they need to learn there and then you know if you are able to learn through like a conversation around how do I deal with the fact that um, my parents are less mature than I am uh, and don't have the cognitive skills to get on how do I find a way to bridge that and get on when my parents or step parents or you know guardians are dysfunctional so i i thinking about education within companies you mentioned l d learning and development in their programs so often they are kind of bereft of these experiential immersive right. uh, programs right. i want to get to a second thing that's so that's a hat tip to the l d folks I want to get to the second point of what you said before which was this notion of attitudes as opposed to capacities and maybe you know competencies on 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 learning a skill do you to what extent do you believe that you can change attitudes because you can say it's rather easy to to learn how to program pascal or basic or whatever but to have the right attitude how do you learn that or how do you change that well that's interesting i think you can approach that from two ways i think a lot of people are recruited into businesses into kind of graduate programs not based on attitude but based on polish so really are we recruiting for attitude i'm not convinced sure, I agree. so like do they have the right degree do they go to the right university in the old days did they have the right mba less relevant now are they connected do they have the did they have the right internship experience so for instance, in this country, there's a 45% conversion from internship into full-time job offer, and in America, it's like 65%. So effectively, the way into the best businesses is through your network and having a work experience. But if you ever go into businesses that's full of privileged kids who don't really want to be, <laughs> who are doing stapling jobs, and you know, none of it makes any yes. sense. So we're back to internships that have immersive components to them where they're learning on the job? Well, do the, A, are these businesses set up for educating young people? I don't think so. Mm. Um, do they feel that, you know, the fact that they've got to give one of their clients an internship experience as an obligation, do, is that fulfilling for anybody? Does the young person want to be there? What are they learning? Are they becoming brand ambassadors for you because, you know, they're not doing anything and sitting around for two weeks? Nobody wins in that, right? Mm. So instead of thinking about um, talent in that way, wh wh why don't we think about it in terms of unlocking the organization's capacity for growth? You know, um, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with white, educated, middle-class men. I am one, and I'm not saying let's get rid of them because I think they're really important. And I, I think one of the big points an issue that I have when people talk about inclusivity they often <laughs> aren't inclusive themselves like they'll blame white middle class men you know you've got to everybody's got to be around the table now back to your point around attitude I, I guarantee you anybody can change their attitude because I have seen it so many times coming through my program where there will be young people who are just about to be permanently excluded who are violent in gangs had very toxic childhoods, very confused, and totally transformed into somebody else. So I do believe that the human ability to change fundamentally is assured. Yeah. So going back to your transformation, you also said you know you change your attitude through an experience, and so experiences, bottom line, are help to anyway transform people. So then it becomes a question of creating the the right environment contextually, right. these immersive programs to help adjust people's attitudes of the like or the ilk. Um, hey, I know everything. I've already done things. I'm very successful. Look at me right now. Right. Let's say white privileged type of background yeah. and help them to understand, amongst other things, that they need to change their attitude. And to what attitude is that? Yeah. Well, great question. So you said a bunch of things. So... 
Um, I w- I w- instead of using the, the word experience, I, I would talk about a framework. So a framework is like a mechanism to, to help somebody see the value or to make sense of some sort of experience whereas an experience could be fleeting or it could be mm-hmm. you know you're having a lot of different experiences and eventually you build up a picture but that sounds a little unconstructed whereas if you have a framework you can then kind of modulize the experiences with having an eye on the output that you want so for that privileged guy that you know went to a great school, had great parents, went to a great university, got a great job, and has just moved through their career fairly seamlessly, gets on with people, good at their job. I guess it's understanding the the fact that how do we move forward as UK PLC to that next green field, that next big breakthrough in profitability? Because right now, I don't see it. We've all, all organizations have already effectively implemented their streamlining strategies of management or logistics. They've all implemented their tech solutions. And if they're in construction or rather if they're in manufacture, they've offshore to find savings through that. What is that next significant market play for UK PLC? And for me, it's what I define as unlocking their diversity dividend. Now, this isn't about per se just hiring ethnically diverse people although when somebody is ethnically diverse it's a very good indicator that they will be able to bring something different because currently most businesses have very few of those and it's not even per se about the their skin color what it is about is their life experience so if they've had a series of different life experiences they're going to have a different filter for stimuli or opportunity and what the diversity dividend does for an organization is it shifts away from a very narrow um, decision making process into unlocking the energy ideas talent and commercial opportunities of all of their people Mm -hmm. and if a business can figure out how to unlock all of their people and align them to a mission by doing things differently because if you do the same things over and over again you're going to get the same results and that's effectively what's happening now because the people making the decisions are kind of the same sort of people and have had the same sort of life experiences whereas if organizations switch on to innovation through having different voices different life experiences it opens up new markets new commercial opportunities and allows organizations to have that next big breakthrough in unlocking all of that human talent capacity within their organization which at the moment i guess it's impossible to put a percentage around but feels very constrained to me you know when i have a a chat with most a lot of people they're not wildly excited about their job I think they're they're happy to have a well-paid job and if it's stimulating it all the better and if they're in positions of authority or really shifting a business that might be very interesting but I don't think that's the case for the average person the statistics will bury that out when you were in your program before I think you called it success for life right you had this idea that scale would happen by identifying influential members yeah, of right. the community yeah. to bring that change of mindset and, and let it filter through their network. Uh, their network. Yeah. Now we're talking about a large PLC with a lot of people. Your program, you can fit 18 people into the room. Yeah. And then you've got to do a thousand of these to reach the uh, you know hundred eighty thousand people yeah. or you know whatever number. <laughs> yeah, um, how do you how do you encourage that type of scaling within an organization? And what maybe have you learned from your past that allowed you to get to this? Okay, so what I've, I think I understand the nature of your question. So I've gone on a journey on on this as well. So I think one of the advantages I have when I first started is because. I was on the commercial side of the business and so was my co-founder. We connected quite quickly to decision makers and client facing people in a way lots of talent organizations couldn't. And that effectively just gave the gave us a bit of traction. 
The trouble thereafter, often, not in every case, and obviously every organization is different, but all organizations have differently challenging issues that need to be addressed when you're trying to do cultural change, is that a number of these engagements are passed to somebody at the edge of the business who doesn't have the skill set and capacity to do very significant business change work. And so effectively it becomes a fringe thing in the organization and doesn't sit on the scorecard of the executive team. So what I what we've learned is we love to work with the executive suite team because effectively it drives this talent agenda, the commercial opportunities into it, in onto the onto the scorecard of the exec team. So I, I, by I, inferring that we're talking about sort of an, um, maybe a weak HR type manager as, a, you know, as opposed to someone who's operational. All right now, let's say you're in, in front of the C-suite and they, they, you've got 15 minutes in front of them, or in this case, one minute. What is the, the pitch that's going to say, all right, I've got to listen to this chap. He's, he, all right, this is it. I'm going to engage him. Well, I think for a long time, people had placed this into, as I said before, helping. And and effectively, then you're trapped into, I'm giving my time helping someone. I'm not going to pay for it, which totally misses the point. Um, so the point of the diversity dividend is this is a commercial opportunity. Not only is it commercial opportunity, it's essential. Because if you're a mid-market business with mid-market services or products charging approximately the same, what is your differentiator unless it's people? But if you haven't got an inclusive culture, then effectively you're already signposting the fact that you're not opening, you're not open as an organization, you're not listening to your staff, you're not innovating, nothing new is going to happen. So you're on a slow decline. And by the way, the best talent won't come and work for you. The best talent will work at, you know, Google, Facebook, wherever, partly because they pay really well and partly because they're doing something interesting. Or they were, let's see what happens in time. The only way that these mid-market organizations can remain relevant and not get eaten by the tech space is by being able to differentiate themselves by the culture and how they engage with the people. The good news is there's a long way to travel in terms of really connecting with all your people and getting all the talent and energy out of it. But organizations will have to do that. Like, why would why would anybody bank with a mid-tier bank firm any longer i mean you know i have more engagement with my paypal or my amazon pay than i do with my bank and there's the sector is so sleepy that effectively they're walking into being eaten alive and it's not just finance or insurance or a law all of these organizations are going to be consumed by ai and tech and unless they can reinvent themselves by getting new ideas into their organization brought about by having new people bringing new ideas and the chemistry of having different sorts of voices at a management leadership level you're going to keep on kicking out the same answers and those answers are going to get you diminishing returns so in my mind the only way organizations are going to reinvent themselves at speed at capacity with urgency is by changing who they recruit and how they get the best out of their people. All right, so I hear you. And having had experience in as a stale, pale male myself organization, you know, you, the, the, the problem is, or the history is, we typically will hire the one individual who can stand out and look like, hey, look, look, we're, we're doing diversity. And inevitably, that doesn't work. Mm. Uh, it, at least there's not enough of a quorum mm. to, to start pushing the differences of opinions and diversity of perspectives. Yeah. How do you get that to happen? Because, you know, you bring the guy in, look what we have, but then we sort of treat it the same way. Mm. And, and there's good intention, mm. but the Pavlovian return to the old tricks and the habits that have allowed me to have the success that I've had today will pay off, but the, you know, in my mind, because that's how I got to where I got to. Mm. So, like I was saying before, some of the issues are baked in socially. Like, if you, it turns out that you need an internship 
uh, to get the best jobs and the only people get internships are those connected. Effectively, we're going to have the same talent moving into the talent pipeline for management and leadership roles anyway. So, and and I think education is is proven to be broken. Like, I, 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 so if your if your recruitment process is to select out of Oxbridge, it's only one point two percent diversity out of Oxbridge, four percent against Russell Group. I mean, you can't select out of those institutions anyway so your model's broken anyways taking a step back that's not how you should see it so it's not about going finding the messiah who's going to somehow you know on a 15 year fast track graduate development track who's going to be your future ceo i don't think that's the way to see it i think recruiting earlier diverse talent is fine but i'm seeing lots of businesses doing that and not changing the culture uh so like for instance will remain nameless a major consultancy firm only has one ethnic partner. Now that is a massive issue if they are going to sell DNI services, which is what they're planning to do. But then it, it gets even worse when you look at their next five-year talent pipeline, and there's very little diversity in that. So even if they wanted to respond to the diversity dividend, their model is stuck and broken. Um, and I think they're trying to resolve it by recruiting into early years diverse talent, but why would they stay? And if only 10% of their people that recruit on a year basis make it into partnership, what's the chances of that one person being the person who's going to somehow be responsible for all diversity? Besides which, the last thing you want to do is put pressure on diverse people to be somehow the champions in your organization and somehow responsible for owning that agenda. That sucks. That's never going to work. So it's, for me, it's about culture. And before it's about culture, it's about understanding that organizations that don't unlock their diversity dividend are toast. I can't put it any more simpler. They're done. <laughs> you know, because the best young talent will judge and assess how innovative and changeable you are as an organization based on the ethnicity, because that's the only snapshot you got of the management team. All right, just one Quick question, DNI. What does that stand for? You mentioned it a couple of times. Diversity and inclusion. Right. So, like, diversity is the makeup of the ethnicity of your people. The inclusion is about how you, the culture and the environment that you create, so that those people or everybody can feel involved and engaged. Yeah. Because it's my daughter, you might feel I'm biased, but what I loved about Alexandra, she. Last year, she did an internship in a Bangladeshi a real estate company where she, there were only Bangladeshis and her. So it was a real eye-opener, and I think we might should include those type of initiatives into education. Daniel, lovely having you on the show. How can anyone who's interested in learning more about your program uh, or, get, or would like to follow you, read what you write and, and your thought, thought uh, leadership, um, do that? So we have a monthly newsletter called The Inclusion that you can read. It's, it's got all of these ideas and lots of guest authors as well. So if you really want to deep dive into some of these thoughts, sign up to the inclusion or give it a read. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Um, on, look up Daniel Snell, uh, Rival Education, or just go to the website, rivaleducation.com, and you'll find us there. And obviously, we'll be happy to listen and connect with you wherever you are in the world. So thank you. Brilliant. I will put all those in the show notes. Great to have you on the show. You've got a, a really lovely uh, and very full approach to this, and I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man.
wouldn't be lying I'm a convinced man building an urge I'm a convinced man to live and die suffer I'm a convinced man in the arms of a woman I'm a convinced man challenge my fate I'm a convinced man competitions in me a convinced man in the arms of a woman despise revenges and struggle to see live for the challenge so life's not incomplete what's wrong with challenge I know soon all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me precipitating the danger to feel free trust in my reason and let me show you why 